Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Galicchio, and I'm the chair of the History Department. On behalf of my colleagues in the Department of History and the College of Arts and Sciences, I'm pleased to welcome you to the fourth annual lecture in the Lord Kephart Distinguished Historians Lecture Series. The program for tonight is pretty straightforward. I will make a few introductory remarks and then turn things over to our guest lecturer. When he has finished the formal part of his lecture, we'll open the floor for questions. Uh, following that, there'll be light refreshments served at the back of the hall. So you want to be sure to stay around. Um, please do not move around during the question and answer session. It makes it difficult for us to hear without uh, what's being said. Before I introduce this evening's speaker, I would like to thank the people who made this event possible. Professor Judith Giesberg, uh, Catherine Carrison and Paul Stege of the lecture committee uh, from the history department, Mrs. Christine Filiberti, also of the history department, Robert Blanchard, assistant dean in the College of Arts and Sciences, and the staff of the Connolly Center. I also want to give special thanks to Diane Brocky, the special events coordinator in the College of Arts and Sciences, for another superb job of coordinating all the activities connected with Professor Grandin's visit to Villanova. Finally, and most important of all, the members of the Department of History wish to thank Horace Kephart and the Kephart family <coughs> for generously endowing this lecture series. The Dis uh, Distinguished Historians Lecture Series honors the memory of Laura Kephart, who after raising a family, returned to college and graduated from Villanova with a major in history and political science. After earning her degree, Laura re uh, remained involved in the life of the history department through her sponsorship and editing of the department's undergraduate journal. The Laura Kephart Distinguished Historian Lecture Series is a fitting tribute to Laura's desire <coughs> to improve the public's understanding of how the past shapes our world today. In bringing to Villanova a historian of national reputation who has demonstrated an ability to reach out to the broader public, the lecture series puts into action Laura's belief that a vigorous engagement with ideas should be a lifelong process that's not confined to the classroom. <coughs> Excuse me. We're privileged to have with us tonight Professor Greg Grandin, a leading scholar of Latin American history. Greg Grandin is professor of history at New York University and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. This year, he is the Gilder uh, Lehrman Fellow at the New York Public Library's Cullman Center for Scholars and Writers. Professor uh, Grandin began his career as a social historian of Latin America. His first book, titled The Blood of Guatemala, A History of Race and Nation, won the Latin American Studies Association's Bryce Wood Award. While doing research for his first book, Professor Grandin also participated in what became known as Guatemala's Truth Commission. That work led to his next book, The Last Colonial Massacre, Latin America and the Cold War, which was an inquiry into the long history of, st of state-sponsored terror against democratic reform movements in Guatemala. The last colonial massacre drew on a wide array of declassified US government documents to reconstruct Washington's role in Guatemala's bloody past. Subsequently, Professor Grandin began to examine how the US experience in Latin America shaped its approach to the wider world. The result of that research appeared in several anthologies and as the book Empire's Workshop. Running through much of Professor Grandin's work on the Cold War in Latin America is a critique of American exceptionalism. That is, the belief that Americans have been called to remake the world in the American image. Grandin delved further into the manifestations of American exceptionalism in his next book, Fordlandia, The Rise and Fall of Henry Ford's Forgotten Jungle City, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award in 2009. In Fordlandia, Grandin vividly recounted Henry Ford's doomed attempt to recreate the American experience, complete with prohibition and regimented workforce in the Amazon jungle. The theme of American exceptionalism continues to intrigue Professor Grandin. It was while teaching a course on that subject that he came upon the Melville novella Benito Sereno, a tale of a slave ship uprising, which, if it were a movie today, would be advertised as being based on actual events. As he explored the history behind Melville's masterpiece, 
Greg expanded his project into a broader study of slavery and freedom in the Americas in the early 19th century. His timing couldn't have been better. <laughs> Excuse me, a discussion of free and unfree labor in the Americas is especially apt as this year marks the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. That's seven score and 10 years, if you're counting. Um, so please join me uh, in welcoming Greg Grant and this evening. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Thank you for that really nice, uh, nice introduction, and um, and thank you to the history department for inviting me, and and uh, and Judith and everybody who made made the trip possible, and um, and thanks particularly to um, Kep Kepard, and and it's uh, just wonderful to be here, and, and you know, in honor of the memory of Laura Kepard. It seems like she's was really a wonderful person, and it's and it's 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 really terrific that an event like this keeps keeps the memory alive. Um, and it's, this is my first opportunity to talk about this project that I've been working on for five or six years doing research in, in a number of different countries. You know, um, Mark mentioned um, that this is based on, uh, on it's, a, it's a history into the events that inspired a, a, a kind of a forgotten masterpiece by Herman Melville, Benito Sereno. You know, in, in, in 1922, when Melville's more famous book, Moby Dick, was, uh, was being rediscovered, for a long time that book um, lingered in obscurity, pretty much after it was published in the early 1850s. Uh, you know, it wasn't read as the masterpiece that we think of it as today. You know, it was pretty much read as an indication of, of Melville's insanity or irrele irrelevance. It wasn't until the 1920s that, that, that critics and readers began to return to it and rediscover it, what, pe what people just call the Melville revival. There was an article that appeared in, um, in, uh, in the Christian Science Monitor in 1922 by a British writer who talked about that there was this, that there was this unknown book that, uh, that certain artful readers would give to people as a, as a test, as an art, certain choice readers would give to readers as, a, as an artful test and to judge people's reactions. Um, and and uh, and and that book was Moby Dick, and you know if if, if one responded to it uh, well, one would one would be considered of like mind. But if one if one didn't, they they wouldn't be told that they were found out. They would you know because the people doing the testing were afraid of their own emotions to, that they had towards Moby Dick. It really is a terrific book. We were talking earlier about how how you know it's not. Really read often in in uh, in in in, um, in universities these days, or particularly in high schools, and and uh, and for those of you, particularly undergraduates who haven't yet read it, one should. But when people would ask me what I was working on, I'd say that I'd be working on a on, on a on a on the true events that inspired a Herman Melville story, and people would immediately say, "Oh, you mean Moby Dick?" and that book has already been written. There is a book about the true history of Moby Dick. And I'd say, no, Benito Sereno. And only about half of the people had even heard of the book, and much fewer, fewer still had read it. But those who did, I think, knew, knew it was something different, that it was, that it was quite a unique book. Um, it was first published in, in 1855. It was serialized in late 1855 in a New York journal called, called Putnam's Monthly. Um, in October, November, and December, and um, and uh, hold on, I got my glasses on here. And um, by that point, Melville's early fame as a South Sea, as a writer, tra a writer of South Sea travelogues, had had, had largely faded. Uh, as I mentioned, most critics mocked pretty much everything that came after, including Moby Dick, including Benito Sereno. Uh, the story takes place mostly on the deck of a, of a, of a Spanish-American slave ship, the San Dominique, um, that's drifting, that seems distressed, uh, anchored in the bay of a remote Pacific island in, off the coast of southern Chile. And it starts with a North American sea captain named Amasa Delano, uh, who was harbored in the same bay on, on, in, in, in his own ship, and he spots the, the Spanish slaver and he comes on board. And it's an incredible story. It's a powerful and disorienting story. 
And today, I think it, you, one might describe it as a, as a cross between, you know, Edgar Allan Poe's The Mask of the Red Death and, and Ridley Scott's Alien, the movie Alien. You know, readers know that there's evil on board, uh, but they don't know who it, is, who, who, it, who it might be or what it is or where it might be lurking. Melville describes the ship as, as, as if it didn't come from the other side of, of, of the island, but almost as if it emerged from the depths of the sea. It was mantled in, he describes it as mantled in vapors, its chains are rusted, it's uh, hearse-like in its roll, it's trailing dark festoons of seagrass, and its ribs are, are pushing through its hull like bones. Now, now for those who haven't read it, and, and I'm assuming that most, most haven't, you know, I'm gonna spoil this, the surprise. Um, and there's really no way, no way around it. Um, the surprise, the suspense of the story is built around the fact that the slaves are in charge of the ship. And so Amasa Delano is, spends all day on board the San Dominique from about seven in the morning to about four or five in the afternoon. He spends most of his time talking with the Spanish captain, Benito Sereno, the, 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 gives the name to the story, gives the title to the story. He observes the ship's operations. He helps distribute food and water to the, to the mass of starving West Africans. And yet the New Englander can't see that it's the slaves and not the Spaniard, Sereno, who, who, who's, who's running things. So led by a small, uh, rude-faced man, as, as Melville describes him, named Babo, B-A-B-O, the West Africans had risen up and seized the vessel about a month earlier. They slaughtered most of the crew, along with the slave trader who was taking them to Lima, Peru, and ordered Sereno, Benito Sereno, to sail them home to Senegal, where they were originally from. But then they ran into Delano Schooner, and before they could leave the Pacific, Rather than make a run for it or, 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 or flee or fight, Babo hatch, hatches a plan. They would let Delano board and Sereno would pretend, would act as if he was still in command, uh, explaining to Delano that, that they had lost all of his offices, rounding the Cape uh, and most of its crew to storms and scurvy and fever. Now the premise seems implausible. You know, how could a, a group of West African slaves recently arrived in the Americas pull off such a, a masquerade? You know, how could they have prevented Benito Sereno or one of his surviving sailors from signaling to Delano that something was amiss? You know, how, could, how could an experienced mariner like Amasa Del Delano, then described by, in the Melville story as in the middle of his third uh, uh, circling of the globe, not guess that something's wrong? But the story is true. It's, it's true not in the way that Moby Dick is true. Moby Dick is, is, is a kind of loose interpretation of the stoving of the whale ship Essex. And it draws on, that book draws as much from King Lear, Shakespeare's King Lear and Milton's Paradise Lost as it does from actual accounts of, of the sinking of the ship. Benito Sereno is a, a faithful interpretation, some have called it out and out plagiarism, of, of drawing from one source. Uh, Amasa Delano's 1817 memoir. Let me see if I can get this. Yeah. I think this is. Yeah, so there's some, um, I don't know what that bar is in front of. Oh, so Melville is on the left around the time that he wrote Benito Sereno. And Amasa Delano, that's an engraving from his 1817 memoir written, you know, about 1816, 1817. So about 40 years prior, 38 years prior to Benito, the, the story of Benito Sereno, uh, the memoir is called A Narrative of Voyages and Travels in the Northern and Southern Hemisphere. So there really was a Spanish captain named Benito Sereno, as his name is written, who in 1804 had his ship seized by, by his West African cargo. And there really was a, a, a West African named Babo, uh, part of a group of, uh, of slaves led actually by his son, Maury, who choreographed this eight or nine hour pantomime of the master-slave relationship, so convincing that it, it fooled the season uh, away team of a Massachusetts sealer. And most improbably, there really was an Amasa Delano, uh, who was the third cousin three times removed of the, of the future president of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But the truth is I haven't really spoiled the mystery. The real mystery isn't so much the deception that the slaves pulled off and its revelation in the story, 
But, um, but the real mystery is how to explain the fact that Amasa Delano couldn't see what was in front of his face. You know, what did Melville intended, intended to mean? So let me just ex little, describe the story a little bit more because it really is a, a kind of amazing story. This, it mostly takes place entirely in, from the perspective, from the, from the field of vision of Amasa Delano. Readers don't know that the slaves are in charge until about two-thirds uh, well into two-thirds into the story. Um, and, and most of the narrative takes place entirely in the thought process of Amasa Delano. He senses something is wrong. He senses something is amiss. But every time an idea begins to take shape in his mind, some, it's chased away. Sometimes it's chased away by uh, uh, the black wizards of Ashante, as, as, uh, as Melville calls them, the sitting in a circle on the ship's uh, high poop deck uh, uh, polishing hatchets and they seem to raise them and bang them together and clash them together uh, every time a thought begins to come take shape in Delano's mind. Uh, other time it's Delano himself that shakes off the thought as, as, as uh, shakes off queer feelings like a, like a mariner shakes off seasickness. And surreal scenes pass in, before his eyes as he waits for the return of the away team. He sends his away team back to his ship to fetch provisions, food and water. And throughout, surviving members of, of Sereno's crew try to tell him things, but he can't decipher, he can't understand their gestures and their words. Looking around, Delano notices that the bow of, 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 of the San Dominique the, you know, is wrapped in a shroud, a canvas shroud, and somebody is ridden underneath it in, in a kind of ch white chalk, uh, the phrase, follow your leader, underneath it. You know, and this, uh, it looks like maybe the, you know, the figurehead of a ship. It's, it's wrapped in, 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 in canvas. So again and again, Melville uses the language of stagecraft to capture the oddness of the setting. These are some quotes. The ship seems unreal, these strange costumes, gestures, and faces, but a shadowy tableau. Sereno, the captain himself, is less an act, a, actor than a prop. He, he doesn't stride the deck stage like a captain, but he rather floats above it as if he had no substance. You know, it's in a, in a passage that calls to mind the way Spike Lee kind of has his characters sometimes glide across a scene as if they weren't moving their legs. Melville has Sereno, uh, describes Sereno as a kind of undemonstrative invalid gliding about, apathetic and mute, a dressed up mannequin conveyed here and there by a group of young boys who hover about him uh, like a school of pilot fish. Now Delano, Delano thinks he's fixated on Sereno. He fears that the Spaniard's sad and nervous behavior is really a pirate's ploy to kill him and, and an alliance with the slaves take his ship. But then he realized that that, that couldn't be. If the, if, the, if the Spanish captain story was an invention, Delano thinks, then, then, then quote, every soul on board down to the youngest negress was his carefully drilled recruit in the plot, unquote. And that would be an incredible infer inference since blacks aren't smart enough to take part in such a conspiracy. But what Delano feels mostly is insecure and insulted. He thinks that Sereno's uh, ar a, a, aloofness, which is really, a, one learns later on, is based on terror and, 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 and the trauma of, of, of living through the 40 days under siege. He mistakes it for a European aristocratic, aristocratic disdain against, against you know, the Yankee, the, the, the kind of young Yankee. But the person Delano is really obsessed with even if he doesn't realize it, is Babo, who never leaves Delano's side. He's described as Delano's, uh, described as Sereno's uh, body servant. The American watches the fey African gently tend to his master. He dresses him, he shaves him, he wipes spittle from his mouth, and he nestles him in his, in his, in his black arms when he seems to faint. Delano begins to fantasize about buying Babo, imagining the, pleasure, the pleasure of being waited on by such a faithful friend and this passage after passage of, of this kind of longing. At one point, there's all this kind of erotic images or fantasies that Delano has towards Babo that's, that's sublimate, that's not, that's not overt, but at one point he notices what, what the reader learns later is, is Babo dressing down Sereno, but he imagines it the other way. He imagines that Sereno is, is, is complaining, is, is, is criticizing Babo, and, and, and Delano calls it a sort of love quarrel. 
So, but one notices upon, if one reads it a second time, that Babo's acting is imperfect. He shows more anger that he sh than he should, and he lets the, the vice of pride jeopardize the objective of the whole deception, and that's to gain freedom for himself and his companion. He, he wants to test the limits, Babo. He wants to see how far he can go and still have a white man think him a slave. At one point, Babo reminds Sereno, Sereno that it's time for a shave, and then you know, it's one of the most brilliantly harrowing scenes ever written in American literature. He proceeds to psychologically torture the Spaniard with a straight razor as Amasa clueless watches. When, when, Sereno, when, when Benito Sereno tells Delano that, that, that Babo has been indispensable in pacifying the other slaves, Babo nearly overplays his fawning. Uh, he sounds a little bit like Gollum in Lord of the Rings here. Uh, ah, master, sighed the black, bowing his face. Don't speak to me. Babo is nothing. What Babo has done was but his duty. But Amasa Delano's blindness compensates for Babo's vanity. He remains fooled. You know, there's this great quote. As master and man stood before him, the black upholding the white, Captain Delano could, could not but bethink him the beauty of that relationship which could present such a spectacle of fidelity on the one hand and confidence on the other. So it's not until the end of the day, close to the end of the story, after Delano and his men have climbed down uh, in, into their whale boat and are making ready to, to leave and go back to their ship that the deception is exposed. Uh, left behind with Babo, uh, Benito Sereno makes a, one last bid to escape. He throws himself off the gun walls of, of his ship, into the, in, crashing down into Delano's whaleboat below, below. But then even then, Amasa Delano, then Melville has Delano floundering in his own confusion for just a few seconds more. He, he thinks Sereno is attacking him. He thinks he is a pirate and he's attacking him. It's not until Babo comes crashing down behind Sereno with knife in hand that, that, that Amasa, Amasa finally realizes what happens. Uh, and then Melville writes, um, you know, finally the scales drop from his eyes and Delano sees the Negroes with masks turned, turned away. His men subdue Babo. Then Delano readies his crew and, and, and pacifies, uh, pacifies the, 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 the rebellion and pacifies the ship with this god-awful vengeance, which I'll talk about in, in a little while. Um, he has a, he has a uh, you know, the, there's a great woodcut, there's a great um, uh, edition of Benito Sereno with these wonderful woodcut engravings, and this is a kind of image of, you can't really, I don't know if you can really make it out, but you can kind of see Babo at the bottom of the image with, with knife in his right hand falling into, falling into the boat. So, but the question is, what does it mean, right? Um, it was ignored throughout the 19th century. Uh, the story was hailed as a masterpiece at the beginning of the 20th century. One critic called it a flaming instance of the author's pure genius when during that Melville revival that I talked about in the 1920s, Benito Sereno was one of these stories that critics really, really enjoyed. But, but there, was, there was a little bit of confusion as to the meaning of the story. What did Melville mean by contrasting Balbo's cunning with Amasa Delano's thickness? by his playing with the reader's perception of events. Now, obviously, it seems to be a story about slavery, right? Except that for a long time, for most of the 20th century, up until the 1960s, 1970s, scholars said it wasn't about slavery. Uh, Columbia's Charles Van Doren in 1928 called, uh, said Benito Sereno equals the best of Joseph Conrad. And, and just like those who read Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness and picked up its Freudian overtones and its mythic echoes and its inward vision, but somehow couldn't understand that the story was really about uh, homicidal Belgian imperialism in the Congo, scholars of Benito Sereno uh, said that it wasn't about slavery and it wasn't about racism. Some said it was an allegory of the clash between uh, European decadence Benito Sereno and American Innocence, Amasa Delano. Others uh, more often thought it a parable of the cosmic struggle between uh, absolute virtue and innocence, Amasa Delano, and absolute evil, Babo. Uh, like Delano himself, critics fixated on Babo and his blackness. Article after scholarly article described the West African as, quote, manifestation of pure evil, the origin of evil, a monster, 
the metaphorical extension of the basic evil in human nature. Baba wasn't a symbol of evil, one scholar said. He wasn't a human being who did evil. Babo is evil. And so it went, blackness and darkness. These are quotes on Melville's predominant symbols of evil. And Babo is blackness, not simple, it's not simply a Negro. He is pure deviltry, a creature of undiluted evil. His actions couldn't be explained in rationalist ter rational terms. It was a mo motiveless malignity. Now, one doesn't need Sigmund Freud or, or W.E.B. Du Bois to understand the excess at play in equating either Babo or the color black with existential evil. If evidence was needed that the story was really about race and slavery, it was offered by most by those who insisted that it wasn't. Uh, as one scholar from Yale, Yale University, Stanley Williams, put it in 1957, Babo, after all, is perhaps, as his name suggests, is just an animal, a mutinous baboon. Now, what did Melville himself mean by the book? You know, Melville, in, in many ways, was the poet and the prophet of American apocalypse. Uh, you know, yet the novel most associated with disaster, with catastrophe, Moby Dick, published a few years, four years before Benito Sereno, is in many ways a joyous book. Uh, scholars now believe that, the, that Moby Dick's driving metaphor is, is America's looming crisis over slavery. Melville, in that book, treats human bondage, human slavery itself, more as a metaphysical problem. And he hints at many possible emotional solutions from the, for those who read it, the black cabin boy Pip's ability to draw out Ahab's humanities, as, as Melville put it, to the love between, uh, to the erotic love between white Ishmael and the, and the, and, and the island of Queequeg. But Benito Sereno is, is much darker and much more hopeless. You know, a lot happened in the United States between uh, uh, when Melville started writing Moby Dick in 1949 and the publication of Benito Sereno in, in 1855, 1849 and 1855 extreme polarization of society between North and South, between proponents of slave, defenders of slavery and abolitionists. And the aftermath of US's uh, victory in its war with Mexico removed the last barrier to the Pacific. You know, many had believed that westward expansion uh, served as a safety valve. It diffused tensions in, in the crowded East with immigrants pouring into cities. But now expansion with Mexico out of the way acted as an accelerant, uh, as slavers, free soilers, abolitionists fought against losing ground against the other in an expanding United States. Um, Congress in 1850 passed uh, uh, the famous compromise, which was meant to diffuse the escalating tensions by, by appeasing the South, but that all that did was delay the reckoning while deepening the predicament. Um, you know, the, the, uh, Congress uh, passed the Kansas-Nebraska Bill, which allowed settlers to decide for themselves all questions pertaining to slavery. That is, the federal government granted white men the democratic right to self-determine whether they would hold black men, women, and children as property. Um, you know, uh, uh, Kansas bled, the border wars, the Whig Party collapsed. In its place came anti-slavery Republicans who would soon send Abraham Lincoln to the White House. And Harriet Beecher Stowe uh, published Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, uh, winning converts to Christ and emancipation and unifying uh, rival abolitionists and polarizing the country even further. In many ways, one can think of Benito Sereno as a kind of devil's edition of, uh, of Stowe's holy book. The slaves in Benito Sereno aren't embodiments of Christian innocence as they are in Uncle Tom's Cabin, but they are, um, they are masters. They're not just masters of, of, of whites, but they're masters of the deception. So Melville's story scrambled in some ways the arguments of, of opponents, and, slavery, uh, opponents and, and advocates of slavery alike. Uh, those who thought that, argued that the law or that liberal, the gradual extension of liberalism would end the crisis of slavery, like many saw in the Amistad story. Uh, uh, you know, Melville gave the story in which, in which you know, just led to complete disaster and violence. Uh, to those who made their case for emancipation by insisting that blacks embodied uh, 
as, uh, as Cincinnati abolitionist Alexander Kinmount put it, the sweeter graces of Christian religion. Melville gave them Babo, you know, a small, slight man whose strength resided in his intellect. His head, Melville describes, as a hive of subtlety. Melville makes no excuses, and he, he pro-offers no, um, no political explanations for Babo's savagery, which is fully exposed at the end of the story. Um, when, the, when, 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 the, when Amasa Delano's men are putting down the, the slave rebellion and pacifying the ship, that canvas shroud uh, over, you know, wrapped around the, the bow of the ship, the figure of the ship is pulled off to reveal the skeleton of the slave, Alejandro Aranda, responsible for the slaves being on the ship in the first place, strapped to the, the, the original figurehead of the ship, which is Christopher Columbus. So there's, there's a lot of, you know, critics have made a lot of the imagery of follow your leader, you know, the, the slaver, the bones of the slaver strapped to the figurehead of Christo Christopher Columbus. And readers find out later that Babo made all of the surviving Spaniards come up to the bow of the ship, look at the skeleton, asking if they could tell whether the, the, whether the, 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 the bones belong to a white person or a black person, you know, because they are white bones and warning them if they didn't bring them back to Senegal, they would, they would follow their leader literally as well as figuratively. But then to those Southern defenders of slavery, people like the Virginian writer George Fitchew insisted that slavery was a more natural, organic relation, social relation than wage labor in the North. That, that relations of obligation and deference, that slavery was this benign system of paternalism. That, in, that, that, that created relations of obligation as opposed to the cold, sterile, hireling system of the North. Um, you know, uh, Melville wrote a story whose whole premise is based on the slave skill in deceiving and dissembling. The ship's troop of slave actors turned white assumptions about their inherent subservience, all of that, all of that imagery of, of, of Delano in his reverie, thinking about how wonderful it would be to be tended by a bot to a, a faithful body servant like Babo, uh, the, 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 the ship's troop of slave actors turned white assumptions about their inherent subservience into a performance, revealing what Southerners said was organic to be artificial, because by definition, a acting is based on artifice and, and renders and renders whatever is being portrayed as artificial. Now, Melville believed in political emancipation. But he often discussed the ideal of freedom as if it was best suited to some inner realm of personal sovereignty, irrespective of a person's external condition. It was a common position for the time in, in, in Walden, Henry David Thoreau, around, around the time that Benito Sereno came out, talked about the need to achieve self-emancipation in the West Indian provinces of the fancy and imagination. Melville's writing prior to Benito Sereno contained characters who were slaves but were made to seem free, and freemen like Ishmael and Ahab and, and Moby Dick who were slaves, mostly to their own tangled thoughts and uncontrollable passions. All human beings, Melville thought, oscillate somewhere between the two extreme poles of freedom and slavery that define much of the political rhetoric of Jacksonian America. There's a famous passage in Moby Dick, and this is where I get the title of the talk from, where Melville writes that all of the tomes of human jurisprudence, all of the written laws of man, could be reduced in essence to the whaler's code, the whaler's rule, that distinguishes fast fish, that is unclaimed, I mean, um, that, that is harpooned fish or hooked on a line fish, and therefore property of a, of, of a, of, of a given party, from loose fish unclaimed and therefore fair game and open to all. But then Melville writes that what plays mischief with this masterly code is the admirable brevity of it, which necessitates a vast volume of commentary to expound on it. And then once expounded, it turns out there's no such thing as an absolutely fast or an absolutely loose fish. Melville writes, what are the rights of man and liberties of the world but loose fish? What are you, reader? but loose fish and fast fish too. Elsewhere in Moby Dick, he says that all men live enveloped in whale lines. All are born with halters around their neck. And then he has Ishmael ask at the beginning of the, of the, of the, of the, of the story when he's, when he's talking about the reasons why he's signing up uh, as a hand on, on the Pequod, who ain't a slave, tell me that. 
But by 1855, Melville could no longer deny that in antebellum America, some slaves were different than others, and that politically, at least, the South's peculiar uh, institution was a singular problem in the nation's history. Now, his abolitionist contemporaries believed they had the answer. They preached Christian reform to bring about national repentance. They practiced civil disobedience to make slave laws inoperable. Uh, uh, some advocated uh, for revolution or war or even disunion. But Melville remained aloof from politics and his writings, including his personal correspondence, uh, are too psychologically complex to pin him as any one thing, a conservative, a racist, a liberal, an imperialist, a pacifist, an abolitionist, an internationalist, or a radical. Melville was you know, often praised what he called a great democratic god and a just spirit of equality that spread out its, you know, its, the royal mantle of humanity. And he was very much aware of Americans' failings. He talked about the metaphysics of Indian hating, uh, Indian killing, uh, you know, not just towards uh, the children of Africa, but its poor, its Native Americans, its tenant farmers, and wage workers. Yet he still thought the United States worth preserving. Uh, later on, he, he has a line in one of his Civil War poems uh, that America was man's fairest hope linked to man's foulest crime. So in the mid-1850s, where others saw solutions, Harriet Beecher Stowe, for instance, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Melville could only see a nation uh, caught in an inescapable dilemma. It could wage war to destroy slavery, which might well destroy the Union, or it could leave slavery alone and, and accept the fact that freedom for some in America required the enslavement of others. And hence, Benito Sereno, Melville's true uh, bleak book of Judgment Day. Now, as I mentioned, the, the story is true. And in some ways, you know, Melville condenses the dilemma you know, to one day on board a, a, a middling-sized uh, schooner in the Pacific Ocean. But the story leading to that day is actually epic in scale. It, it sprawls in the background, the background of the Napoleonic Wars, the Age of Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, the American Revolution, the Spanish-American Revolution. Um, it really is, uh, you know, it really is um, uh, 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 a, a kind of epic story. Um, you know, I've done research on, you know, four continents and eight countries, and you know, the story, as as I mentioned, unfolds against, you know, this, you know, the, the age of democratic revolution. You know, just to give you a sense of, um, let me see, I thought I had another map. Maybe I don't. Maybe that's the only map I have. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I thought I had also a map with Latin America and the Pacific. So, so one of the things that I've done in, in, writing, in trying to trace the history of the story is, is, is figure out the itinerary of the slaves, and it's actually quite remarkable. I mean, most, you know, most accounts of slavery have documented the horrors of the Middle Passage. Um, most of the Africans on, on the trial, which is, was the, name, the real name of the slave, the, the slave ship, Melville changed it to San Dominique as a kind of hat tip, a kind of nod towards Haiti at the time, um, had come from West Africa, had come from Senegal. And, um, and they were actually boarded on a Liverpool slave ship bound for Barbados, but the slave ship was, was um, seized by a, by a French revolutionary pirate, a Jacobin pirate who brought them to Montevideo in Buenos Aires. Uh, it was, it was, it was a, a, a cargo of about 349 slaves. Some were sent to Lima via the Cape Horn, down around Cape Horn and up to Lima. Others, after a couple of months of being caught in the corruption and intrigue of, of Buenos Aires, it was too complicated to describe here, were eventually sold to, a, to, to Alejandro Aranda, who was a slave trader, kind of middling slave trader from Mendoza in Argentina, which is kind of inland, right at the foothills of the Andes on the other side of the Pampas. And, uh, and he marched them across the, the, the Pampas, across Argentina, this enormously flat, impossibly flat kind of scrubland desert. Some of you probably know, you know it's, it's kind of a natural wonder, the, the Argentine pump is kind of like the US Plains. Um, and, then, um, and then they were forced over the Andes. Now, if they were from West Africa, they were, they were, they were from a region you know, of gently rising plateaus and, you know, and marshlands and grasslands. And all of a sudden, you know, suddenly, not only did they survive the Middle Passage, 
but then and then and then and then this forced trek overland across the American continent, but then over the Andes. The Andes are the the Andes are the, the kind of highest uh, mountain range in the world, a second highest mountain range in the world. But what makes them particularly dramatic is that they are the narrowest, so that they're, they're really stark as you as you're approaching it. And 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 one of the places that they they were marched over. This is this is they would have walked underneath the shadow of the highest peak in the in, in the Americas, Mount Aconcagua, which is you know 20, 23,000 feet. And that's just a description of what it looked like. The other remarkable thing, and, uh, and, and one of the things about this story that actually didn't make it, that wasn't either in Amasa Delano's memoir or in, in Melville's rendition, is that the slaves were, were Muslim. They were Sufi Muslim, probably, most likely Sufi Muslim, described as Moors in Spanish documents. And, um, and that year, coincidentally enough, uh, so, so there's evidence that they kept the Islamic calendar you know, the thing about Islamic calendar is a lunar calendar, and one of the things about um, one of the th one of the things that's interesting is that is that north of the equator, the, the phases of the moon are the same north of the equator where Senegal is, and south of the equator where the where where this passage and this voyage would have taken place. Except that the progression of the phases goes in opposite directions, so you could imagine the kind of strangeness, the kind of world turned upside down, you know, of of what it was to kind of track try to keep track of, 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 one's, of one's calendar through the phases of the moon, but then have it kind of slightly reversed. You know, going across the Pampas in, in, in many ways would have been eerily similar to some of the, some of the terrain in Senegal, where, where some of them might have been from. And, and one, of the, one of the coincidences of, of, of this story, or one of the inter interesting things about this story, is that Ramadan started right when they started uh, ascending the Andes, right when they began their trek up the Andes, you know Ramadan is this kind of you know the the the, the uh, a month in, that 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 symbolizes history's transcendence when history stops, and here they were literally and oftentimes particularly you know you know if they were if they were if they were Sufi Muslim, um, you know with a strong kind of mystic tradition. The, you know, oftentimes the kind of approach to the Godhead is, is symbolized in terms of ascent, and here they were literally ascending. And, 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 you know, Charles Darwin crossed exactly on the same road in the 1830s, and he talked about the extreme clarity of the air, which, you know, because there's no moisture in the air, so it, 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 it does away with all, all perspective. You can't judge distance because there's no kind of, there's no refractory light in the air. So you can imagine the kind of strangeness and then, um, and then, then down on the other side, and then back on yet another ship, and 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 then um, and then they revolt. Then the, the night of the revolt was the holiest day of Ramadan, the night of power, uh, when in in the Islamic tradition, uh, Allah revealed the Quran, some verses of the Quran to Muhammad. That's the that's the that's the day in which the revolt took place. So there's this interesting kind of coming together of the Protestantism of Amasa Delano, the Catholicism of Benito Sereno, and the and the and the and the Islam of the of the slaves of Babo and Mori. Um, you know, uh, one of the other things, um, as I mentioned, you know, Babo Melville gets the story. Oh, here's the here's the other map that I was thinking about. So you get a sense of the voyage. So they they they, they probably were embarked. Somewhere, you know, in Senegal, where the you know the the, the bulge of, of Africa juts out into the Atlantic and heading towards the Caribbean, intercepted by a French Jacobin pirate, brought back to Montevideo. Some of the slaves were brought around the Cape and up to Lima. Others were marched across and over the Andes. You get a sense of just how sweeping. You know, oftentimes we don't think of American slavery. You know, most you know the experience of most slaves after the Middle Passage is to work and die on plantations close to the Atlantic and Piedmont plantations close to the port in which they disembarked. And this is a much more extensive, much more panoramic and, 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 uh, and uh, an intense journey. The other part of the story, um, as I mentioned, Melville gets his story from Amasa Delano. Amasa Delano wasn't a whaler like Ahab. He was a sealer. Um, and he came from a small fishing village, shipbuilding village in Massachusetts, Duxbury, uh, 
And sealing, it was this intense industry that, that, um, that really picks up at the end of the 1700s into the early 1800s. His first sealing vi uh, 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 voyage, which took place prior to the voyage in which he encountered the trial, was enormously profitable. Um, seal prices, seal skins were, and furs were selling for, a norm, for very high, uh, high, high market price in Canton in China. By the time of his second sealing voyage, seals were practically wiped out. Um, what's interesting about the sealing industry, if, for those of you who read Melville's Moby Dick, Melville talks about whaling almost as if you know, the whaling industry as a kind of proto-industrialization. It pulls men together you know, and creates this kind of sublime synchronicity of, of workers pulling value out of nature and the kind of love and the kind of, uh, you know, kind of, um, uh, uh, of, of, of intense kind of what he calls God's divinity in human, in, in human labor. Sealing was something else, all, else entirely. Sealers would drop men off on these islands, away teams off the islands, leave them there for up to a year, two years, three years, and they, you know, intensely isolated, alone, uh, and they'd wind up you know, in, in order to club seals and kill seals and gather, and gather their skins and furs. It, it, was less, it seemed less like industrialization and more like, and more like settler colonialism. And within a remarkably short time, what you saw happening, particularly in the, the Chilean islands and the Antarctic islands of the South Pacific, is the market in China for seal skins was glutted. Prices were dropping, you know, seals were practically, seal skins were practically being given away in Canton, even as the seals were being wiped off. So extinction and oversupply went hand in hand. So by the time Delano goes on his second trip, um, he, uh, He's, he, there's no seals to be had. These away teams are fighting each other. He, he, he tries his luck in Australia. Uh, he, he, he gets into these pitched battles with British sealers. He gets driven off of, he gets driven off of Australia. He tries his hand back in the, in the Southern Pacific around Chile. Um, by this time, his crew is practically mutinous. There's no money to be made. They've been on the ship for over a year. It's clear that the voyage is a bust. He's resorting more and more to physical coercion, to whipping, to flogging, to other uh, corporal punishments in order to maintain his authority, which is quickly evaporating. So there's a way in which, so, that, so, his, um, so, so by the time he comes upon the trial, and after all of the events of that day, when it's time to rally, uh, rally his men to put down, put down the revolt and put down, you know, and retake the this, this Spanish ship, it allows him to restore his own authority uh, and reestablish his authority. But he doesn't necessarily, but that, that authority doesn't, it doesn't last long. And, and, um, and one of the things that he wants, so Melville in, 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 in the story winds up having Amasa Delano console in a broken sereno after, at the end of the story. But in real life, Amasa Delano spends close to a year trying to, hounding sereno, trying to get half the value of the slaves, uh, which he finally gets 8,000 pes uh, pesos in, in Lima, basically just as a way of, 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 paying, of paying off his own crew. So there's a, there's a kind of way in which environmental history and the history of sealing and, and, and the brutality involved with sealing kind of intersect with the history of slavery in interesting ways in, in, in this story. Um, you know, let me just conclude and then I'll open it up for questions by talking a little bit of how I started thinking about this comparison between Ahab and Amasa Delano. Ahab, there's obviously a lot of different, different renditions of what Ahab looked like. He's a, he's a fictional character, and this I pulled off of, of the web of a cartoon version, a comic version of, of, of Moby Dick. But um, you know, Ahab seems to be the symbol of monomaniacal obsession. Amasa Delano, in his memoirs, comes across as intensely controlled, self-controlled. He, he, he was, a, he was a prime example of what I like to call the self-madeism of, of, of the late 18th century, the early 19th century. This kind of ideology of the American Revolution that believes that you can control your passions, you can control your, your base instincts and balance them with your virtues and your, and, and, uh, and in, order to, in order to kind of self-regulate yourself. And there's a lot of that running in his memoirs. This seems to be the exact opposite of a character like Ahab. Now obviously, Melville wrote Ahab. The real Amasa Delano came before uh, the fictional Ahab, and I guess the fictional 
Delano came after the fictional Ahab, but in some ways I, I kind of like to think of them as, as a kind of progression. You know, there's different ways of thinking about Ahab's insanity. You know, oftentimes uh, one can think of his obsession with the white whale as, as a moral failing, as the, as, as, the, as the vice of ambition or the vice of ego or the vice of or the vice of immoderation and arrogance and hubris, right? All of these kind of personal attributes. But you know, some scholars have, have seen in Ahab, you know, have given a more social explanation for Ahab's wild egoism, kind of an expression of the social changes that were galvanizing uh, Jacksonian America uh, at the time, the violence involved in the creation of what we think of as the modern world. You know, war and slavery, the dispossession of Native Americans, expansion, the spread of, the, of market, the rise of finance capital, the beginnings of industrialization, and this intense exploitation of nature, particularly on the frontier, bred an extreme form of human isolation. And in the character of Ahab, it's almost as if Melville was taking Ralph Waldo Emerson's transcendental concept of self-reliance and projecting it into the Pacific in transforming it in, in, in Ahab's madness into a kind of an individual supremacy, unable to connect with any other human being uh, on board the ship. So in, in that sense, if, if one think of Ahab's malady as his severance from the rest of humanity, then, then in some ways Amasa Delano, both the historical figure and Melville's interpretation, is not his opposite but his shadow, and Amasa we can think of as the surface calm to Ahab's churning depths. Both are intense isolates, and both in their own way are blinded by their isolation. Ahab thrusts his solitude outward like a sword against the world, while Amasa for the most part turns inward. You know, you can read his memoir, you know, 500 pages of the memoir, he barely mentions another sailor, another crew member. You would think that he was sailing his ship by himself. Um, like Ahab, the historical Delano was, a, was, you know, presided over one of the great wasteful and predatory industries of the 19th century. And like Ahab, Delano rallies his crew to the chase, you know, not of a white whale, but of black rebels. And some readers see in Ahab as a, as a you know, in the mesmeric hold that he has over his men, a kind of prototypical, prototype totalitarian, you know, Mussolini or Hitler and all the kind of charismatic totalitarianism of the 20th century. But Delano in some ways represents a more mundane kind of power based not on the psychic pull of charisma but on everyday racism, control over labor and the struggle over diminishing natural resources. Uh, as I mentioned in Delano's case, uh, the capture of the ship helped him to maintain authority over a crew of sailors who were on the brink of mutinying themselves because there were no seals left to kill and no money to be made. As I mentioned, the real Amasa Delano existed before the fictional Ahab began to take shape in, Amasa, in, in Melville's mind, but I often think of them as, as Melville wrote them, with Ahab coming first. A progress that in many ways tracks America's progress during Melville's lifetime. So Melville was a boy when the brooding Andrew Jackson won the presidency, and he wrote Benito Sereno when the hapless Franklin Pierce was in the White House. Both presidents enacted policies that drove the country closer to civil war, yet where Jackson, like Ahab, was tormented and tumultuous, uh, Franklin Pierce, despite his depression and his alcoholism, he died of cirrhosis of the liver, easily stifled his larger darker, deeper part, and that's a quote from Moby Dick about Ahab, and, and confronted the vortex with good cheer, kind of like Amasa Delano. It was almost as if the wars and the ceaseless territorial expansion and the financialization of capitalism had emptied the stuff out of America, leaving Americans to live on the surface where shadows are detached from substance and seeming as indistinguishable from being. Now, in books written before Moby Dick, Melville believed in young America, like many writers of the time and many who would come since, he thought that, quote, to become an America is essentially to divest oneself of the past, to make a radical break with the past. Melville thought, for instance, that the Navy might abolish flogging, which for Melville was a metaphor of all arbitrary forms of power, be it on a, slave, on a ship, Navy ship or a plantation, but end, end flogging by breaking with the past and embracing the future. You know, he wrote in, at the end of the 1840s, the past is dead, 
future is both hope and fruition. America must make precedents and not obey them. But by the time he published Benito Sereno in the 1850s, with America on course for the Civil War, Melville could no longer believe that the country had or could escape history, especially when it came to dealing with slavery. You know, we all live enveloped in whale lines, he wrote, a sentiment that applied to nations as well as people. And America was, was you know, in some ways the fastest of fast fish, a prisoner who didn't realize he was in shame because he couldn't see his chains. Now the end of, uh, there's another woodprint, the end of Benito Sereno captures Melville's darker turn. You know, it's a brilliant last scene. Um, Amasa Delano is comforting a broken Benito Sereno in a Lima monastery as Babo's head, the, the slaves were brought back to Concepcion, executed, the heads were put on a pike, the leaders of the revolt, the rest were sold, into, sold back into slavery. And so they have Amasa Delano comforting a, a broken Benito Sereno and, and, he, and he says to him, but the past is past, why moralize upon it? Uh, uh, Melville has a masa ask Sereno at the end of the story, forget it, see, uh, look at the bright sun, the bright sun has forgotten it all, the blue sky, the blue sea, they have turned over new leaves. Why, the American wants to know, can't the Spaniard be like the bright sun and the blue sky and the blue sea? Um, and then Sereno replies, because they have no memory, because they are not human. And then Delano persists, but these mild trade winds that now fan your cheek, do they not come from a, do they not come with a human-like healing to you? They are steadfast friends, uh, you know, steadfast friends are the trade winds. Now, Melville didn't have to make this kind of oblivion up. It was a strange kind of crisis America was living through in the 1850s under the leadership of the Amasa-like Franklin Pierce. He presided over this kind of bubble of national confidence and unprecedented Wall Street profit. Denial was all around Melville and his friends and his neighbors and people whom he respected. Nathaniel Hawthorne, you know, a good friend of Melville, at least for a time, uh, you know, talked about slave and master dwelling together in peace and affection uh, better than have existed anywhere between the taskmaster and the serf. His neighbor, Oliver Wendell Holmes, spoke warmly about, quote, the slavery and slavery in its best and mildest forms, like the, you know, just like the kind the fictional Delano believed existed between Sereno and Babo until proven otherwise. It was almost as if in an effort to avoid history, that is the burden of slavery, they simply suspended history and clung instead uh, to nostalgia. And I just want to end very quickly by saying, you know, after, after Benito Sereno, Melville continued. You know, he, he, he never found the, the recognition or the, or, the, or, the, or the wealth or the, or the fame that, that, he, that he had wanted, but he continued to write and he continued to kind of be out of step with America. You know, his very last book, which he wrote in the 1880s, in the middle of America's Industrial Revolution, was Billy Budd, which was, you know, a throwback to the Napoleonic Wars and the age of sale. It seemed like, it seemed like America had moved on. But in some ways, I think, you know, America hadn't moved on, and that was the warning of Benito Sereno, that slavery and the fight to end slavery froze in place a split view of human nature that made the U.S. in some way unable to respond in an honest way to the problems it confronted. So just let me bring it to the present, and I'll end. Shortly after Barack Obama's presidential election in victory in 2008, um, a bookstore in Manhattan ran a display that listed the books that influenced him in the 1920s, and among them was Benito Sereno, which I think that if he remembered the story might have provided him with a hint of the backlash to come. You know, for as the 1850s, so in the, in the 2010s. You know, the United States, as we know, faces crises that dwarf the talents of its political class. They were as, they're as existential today as slavery was then, and you know, not just to the nation, but to the world. When you think about the environment's point of no return comes ever closer. Now, whatever the merits of Barack Obama's presidency, it's the language of the backlash that I think that reveals the depth of the paralysis. Confronted with 21st century problems, they respond with rhetoric and symbols that I think Herman Melville would have recognized. They talk of secession and nullification. They frame policy debates related to, say, healthcare or global warming as struggles unto death between 
the absolutes of freedom and slavery, loose fish and fast fish. They cling to an individual supremacy as debilitating as Amas's and, 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 and dangerous as Ahab's. And they persist in, in, in their belief that Obama is Babo-like in his artifice. He's the architect of a decades-long plot to make himself seem other than what he really is, a, a Muslim, a foreigner, a socialist. And you know, they even at times display his black head on a pike to make their point. You know, Clint Eastwood, right after that, uh, the, the Republican convention in an interview explaining his opposition to the Obama administration called, uh, President Obama is the greatest hoax ever perpetuated on the American people. Uh, one can like or dislike Obama, but to call him the greatest hoax that has ever been perpetuated on the American people seems a bit excessive and not, not unlike, I think, maybe critics' reaction to Babo in the early 20th century. Uh, so it seems that 110 years after the appearance of Herman Melville's nearly forgotten story, it seems that in some ways America hasn't really left the deck of the San Dominique. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. <laughs> right. I was wondering, when you look at, 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 at the way that um, uh, uh, the critics, when you look at the way that the critics of the 1920s approached uh, 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 the story, and especially approached the way that they, uh, 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 that they, that they describe problems, right? Uh, you think that, uh, in, in some ways, uh, what comes later uh, with the cutting off the, of the head, the barbarism that comes later with putting down the rebellion, is justified by making uh, a bottle the evil person. Thus, you can you can take whatever measures necessary to end that evil, and in the same way that if if you look at, at, at Reconstruction or at the end of Reconstruction, um, you show an evil black person, and then you can use whatever means necessary to destroy that black person. As the same as describing President Obama in such a way, um, so that if he's a hoax, then you can use whatever means is necessary, even if it means extra legal means to, to, uh, to, uh, to get rid of. Yeah, I mean, I think that in a lot of ways, this is a, this question and 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 what you point out to the the kind of. The, the, the retaliatory or the circular logic of violence in order to justify more violence is inherent in the, you know, in the institution of slavery, be it Reconstruction or later, I think. You know, one of the things that I didn't mention and I, I meant to come back to was, was exactly that, the horrific violence. Melville doesn't really talk about it so much in the story, but in the, in the actual event, Massa Delano is open about the, the what, I mean, they, they take the ceiling lances and they disembowel and flail the rebels. You know, and after they put after they put down the, after they put down the revolt. So that, again, that intersection between the violence of sealing and the violence of slavery, which is just so 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 comes together so strongly at that point. And and he, and he says it. With, Melville didn't really include that that particular uh, bit in, in in the story. But I think in some ways, you know, I they, I think the critics of the 1920s didn't even bother to justify. You know, saying the story wasn't about slavery or, or focusing on, on on blackness as a symbol of evil in Babo. They just they just did it. You know, what's interesting is that concurrent with this, there's a whole alternative reading of uh, of, of Benito Sereno that in some ways it was an underground underground book for for the rise. You know, particularly coming out of the civil rights movement, Ralph Ellison uses a, a, an epigraph from from Benito Sereno to open Invisible Man, and then later on in the 60s and 70s, C.L.R. James in 1953 writes about Benito Sereno in his great book on Melville, but then, um, but then, um, you know, African American writers begin to embrace the character. There's almost a correlation between as as the as Uncle Tom becomes a symbol of of um, you know of uh, so there's an interesting the way that you know that 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 the story kind of lives on even and then eventually white scholars eventually come around to seeing you know that the more the, that the story is about slavery and the complexity of 
of Melville's portrayal of the character. Anybody else? Did some people? And I wonder too, you mentioned this in your talk um, earlier, uh, that I mean, what struck me about the passages that my class read was the intimacy too, you know, that the story that he's telling is about, um, um, you know, whites and blacks who are intimately connected. Um, and I wonder if you want to say anything more about that. He really does seem to spend a lot of time talking about that sort of the intimate connection they have with one another and how that Gallant Delano is intrigued by that. Yeah, I mean, there's all, you know, in a lot of Melville's writings, there's a lot of kind of, there's a lot of kind of emotional subtext that runs through the relationships between men, you know, and Moby Dick, Ishmael, and Queequeg, which is pretty overt. But there's, you know, you, one could read, when, when I said that Delano thinks he's fixated on Sereno, but he's really fixated on Pablo, it's, it's, it's just this, this intense longing to be tended to by what's described as a body servant. You know, and, and the way that Babo is gently holding up Sereno, there is this kind of intimate belonging. One of the things to take the question in a slightly different direction about, but about intimacy and slavery, one of the things in doing this story is that this, I found so many coincidences that, that, that I thought I had to kind of explain by the, in the terms of the story. I won't go into, into, into detail, but, you, but, but I think what it was is that slavery was, despite how vast it was, sprawling across you know, North America, South America, the Atlantic Ocean, Africa, and Europe, it really, was, it really kind of was, it made, it made the world smaller. It was an intimate institution. It, 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 it brought people together in all sorts of unexpected ways. It was, it was in some ways the total institution of the Americas that gave meaning. So, so oftentimes try and explain these coincidences. So what, here's a coincidence. I mean, it's not directly related to slavery, but kind of. So um, Herman Melville's father-in-law, Lemuel Shaw, and financial patron, was, um, was a, the Massachusetts Supreme Court justice. And he was famously, was, he's opposed to slavery, but he ruled in, in, in the early 1850s in upholding the Fugitive Slave Act, sending escaped African uh, slaves back to the South and back to plantations. This was a, this remarkable kind of polarizing moment and galvanizing moment for the abolitionist movement in the North. This is Melville's father-in-law, and many people see him writing Benito Sereno and other stories, you know, Billy Budd, as a kind of ongoing trying to grapple with the problem of slavery to union that, that was embodied in his father-in-law. It was his father-in-law who 30 or something years earlier, more than 30 years earlier, was Amasa Delano's lawyer who drew up the publishing contract for, 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 for the book that Melville, so Melville writes Benito Sereno as the masterwork of, 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 the, Christ, of the slavery crisis, part, the crisis that was partly precipitated by his father-in-law and he draws on the book that his father-in-law helped get published. So here's, an, here's, another, here's another one. So the judge who tries the West African leaders in Concepcion, Chile, um, goes on to be Chile's independence leader, one of independ Chile's independence leaders. He was the equivalent of, you know, of Thomas Jefferson and you know, George Washington, um, uh, 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 um, Martinez de Rosas. And he, um, uh, he, uh, he, um, he, he was also the child, but he grew up in Argentina, and he was the childhood friend of the slaver who was executed by Babo. So there's all of these odd intersections that, you know, there's, there's other ones that are too minute and in detail to get into. Um, but here's another one. So um, <laughs> Melville's first extensive engagement with slavery is in this book that was published in the late 1840s called Redburn. And it's kind of an autobiographical novel of a, of, a, of a sailor. And the sailor is in Liverpool. And he comes across a statue to Lord Nelson, Lord Horatio Nelson. And it's a statue uh, celebrating Lord Nelson's victory at Trafalgar, where Nelson beats the combined French and Spanish forces, but he dies in the effort. So it's a, the statue is kind of Nelson, you know, 
dying in this moment of triumph. But then it has these images of French and Spanish uh, prisoners of war around the pedestal of the base. Melville writes this unbe these unbelievable three or four paragraphs that um, that uh, that that says that he doesn't. It doesn't remind him of prisoners of war. It reminds him of slaves in the marketplace. And then it's a total stream of consciousness that goes from that to you know building the wealth of Liverpool, and then the then then the then the um, then the uh, then 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 the Carolinas, and slaves in the Carolinas, and then talking about abolition in, in his father's house growing up, and it's this kind of stream of consciousness about slavery and the wrongs of Africa. Well, it turns out so that's the first that's his first engagement with slavery. It turns out that the person, one of the people on the committee that funded that statue, was the slaver, who, who. Um, who was responsible for enslaving the West Africans? That was that slave ship that was captured by the French Revolutionary. That was, the slaver's name was John Bolton. He was he was a, a kind of a, a Tory in Liverpool. He was one of the primary people responsible for erecting that statue. So there's all of these odd circles. Like how do you explain that? Like how do you explain these these coincidences? And so I just realized, so at some point it dawned on me that the point wasn't necessarily to exp that these coincidences don't explain the mechanics of slavery, how slavery worked, but how slavery gave meaning to apparently random events in this vast Atlantic world. Like, you know, slavery was such a totalizing institution that it invest invested random events with meaning, with its own kind of synchronicity, to use a kind of Jungian phrase, a kind of cre slavery was part, so much part of the collective unconscious of the West. That 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 it invested these these seemingly random associations with shared meaning. There's a lot of other ones that bring the story together that I won't go into because it's too much detail. But but it, it's amazing. So so slavery actually creates a kind of intimacy, a kind of historical intimacy. I think just just by just the fact that it pulls in pulls in lore and politics and economics and literature. And, and brings together all of you know these people from diverse backgrounds and diverse, and the fact that the slave trade in particularly in South America took place through families. It was cousins, it was fathers and sons who ran the slave trade, who extended credit, who arranged the transport. Right, so it was a very familiar, intimate insti you know institution. So I think that some of that intimacy is captured in the story. I have a question that uh, asks. Uh, you to go in a somewhat different direction. Uh, your research and, and this presentation are really fascinating example of the complexities of the relationship between history and literature. And even your choice to approach this question of uh, international slavery and slave rebellion and the issues of race in the 1850s in America by your choice of using a work of fiction is really very suggestive. And I'm wondering if you would care to talk a little bit about what you learned about the relationship with history, between history and literature, uh, why certain writers select certain historical incidents, and what that selection can tell us about a historical moment, as well as a, historical, as a work of literature. And uh, would you do this again? Well, I mean, I think I, 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 it's a great question. It's it's um, I'd have to give it I'd have to give it more thought to, to, to have a, a thoughtful answer. But um, you know, I, I think in some ways, one Melville I think is a little particular. I think that he is you know Melville was was so much imbricated in his time in ways that are fascinating because it wasn't a simple reflection of politics. It takes so much to suss out. Like obviously all of his works are metaphors for politics in some ways. They're deeply about politics and history, but then they're not at the same time. Right? They're also their own thing. So you know, I, I mean I, I, I don't the relationship between I mean in some ways literature are these histor is this historical product you know, historical Articles and, and products that reflect the time, and, you know, of their moment, the, you know, the, of the, 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 you know, and, and what was going on. So you kind of unpack it. I mean, I think like anything else, I think the trick is is not to be reductionist, not to just reduce it, you know, not just take the, you know, not just you know, the way to integrate the the parts to the whole. 
without you know losing the particularity, the integrity of the parts, or losing meaning from the whole. I mean, I, but I don't know if I have any particular insight other than you know other than other than you know this this is obviously an historical a, a, a work of literature that has deep historical resonance that and that and that opens up. You know, I'm I'm trying. But I'm also kind of shying away from doing a, a close textual literary analysis because that's what, because it's Melville, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's almost as many books on Melville as there are on Henry Ford and the Amazon. You know, there's, there's you know, an unbelievable amount of writing about Melville. And, 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 and this is, I think, a way of, um, of drawing on that without, but, but, a, but, 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 but maybe moving, not moving beyond, but a different, opening up different questions by looking at the history behind it, but without necessarily making a strong argument about what the story itself means. I'm not really invested in proving that, that Benito Sereno was a, a work of anti-racism anti or it was racist or, you know, I think it was, it was what it was of the moment and embodied all of the, all, both of those things at the same time. And so I think that, that that's what I would say. There was a question of Prime. Yeah, when I came in and first started seeing your talk, I thought that what was going to happen was going to be increasing about a sort of black legend. That there was going to be the sense that, well, of course, this slavery was particularly terrible because it was a Spanish captain. And I was interested uh, in a couple of things. One, when you said that, I think, I may have misunderstood, that the detail about the, the French captain Captain was not in the novel story. Um, and also that you had talked about how Catholicism, Islam, and Protestantism were headed our story. So I was wondering if you might sort of address if, if there is a situation that perhaps the Spanish um, slave uh, trader and captain are maybe not so relevant to Melville's purpose, and if indeed there are more details about the Catholicism and Islam, for example, other than the mission. Right, that, that really sh shouted out to you that maybe made the situation more global in terms of the global issues of slavery or more complicated? Well, Melville wasn't really concerned about how the slaves got on the ship. It was all, that, uh, you know, it was all very much condensed, uh, you know, in a very small space in a very short time. And that's, that, that con condensation is, you know, where he, how he manages to encapsulate the dilemma that I talked about in, in brilliant ways. I think you can unpack it, and you know if so. If you know if 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 if, if you think of Benito Sereno as the public performance of the dilemma, this is the kind of backstage history how how they got there. Um, I think there's a lot. So he wasn't particularly concerned about you know the the French Jacobin pirate, but I am because what's interesting about that, and I again I didn't want to go into this in detail. There's a lot of kind of celebration of pirates as like you know. You know, uh, seaborne anarchists. You know, sailing the, 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 you know, sailing the seas ever free. You know, in Buenos Aires and Montevideo, at least pirates or, or privateers. You know, pirates are a little sensational. They were really privateers. Were um, kind of the advance guard of merchant capitalists. They worked under contract with Buenos Aires and 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 Montevideo and merchants. You know, linked to to merchant houses in in Spain. And they, you know, seized British goods, including slaves, and brought them into Montevideo and Buenos Aires. So they were very much involved in in that early kind of mercantile capitalism that Buenos Aires become, later becomes famous for. You know, Buenos Aires becomes this merchant city. Um, and uh, so I, I was interested in that. I was interested a little bit in the contradiction of you know that he was a French revolutionary, and you know, France at that point. Um, had abolished slavery, but then Napoleon had restored it, and you know the contradiction of you know on board his ship were was were, were sailors of color who you know who, who you know probably sang the Marseillaise and, and you know and, and and chanted revolutionary slogans even as they were seizing you know African slaves and shackling them and and, and selling them. So the con you know the deep contradictions within you know the age of democratic revolution I think can be really much really captured that in terms of the Islam you know. Um, in terms of the Catholicism and the Protestantism, um, again, I didn't go too much into this, but one of the things that I tried to do was draw out, you know, Delano, Amasa Delano really is a kind of new man of the American Revolution. He, he, um, he, he comes of age during that upswing of, of you know, that prehistory of Unitarianism, the, 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 
the, the, the kind of shedding the, the predetermination and, 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 and the, 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 the strict Calvinism of his parents and grandparents and really that Christian optimism that makes the American Revolution so radical, this notion that people have, you know, have control over themselves and have free will, and yet, and yet he's thrust into a world that is, you know, that, that he has really little control over, even though he's raised on this, you know, raised on this notion of, of self-madeism. And there's analogs to that within, Catholic, within Catholicism, the, the emergence of a kind of, um, you know, I was, I'm, I was interested in the, uh, the emergence. What happens under Spanish mercantilism at this point is the s Spanish slave trade is heavily regulated for most of the centuries that it operates under. It's, it's uh, the prime institution of Spanish mercantilism. Only a few either companies or countries have the right to trade, to trade in slaves in Spanish America. But by the 1770s, 1780s, there's an increased liberalization of trade in general and slavery, in, you know, and, and particularly in slavery and slaves, what the Spaniards out and out call free trade in slaves. So, what, so the, this, the, this emergence, so I'm, I'm interested in this kind of emergence of a kind of, 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 of the notion of, of an individual realm of sovereignty um, that, that, that both justifies free trade, uh, including the free trade of slaves and sees Africans as property, but then also eventually gives rise to the abolitionist movement at the same time, right, the contradiction. Like a lot of that is deep in, within Catholic thought as it is within Protestant thought. And one of the things that I'm, you know, I haven't quite worked out, but I'm interested in, in the overlap and, and the similarities between the two. So it's not the black legend at all. It's the opposite of the black legend looking for, you know, look, looking for points of convergence in some ways, you know. Yeah, but again, that goes back to the other question about literature. I mean, I guess, I guess Melville traded a little bit in the black legend, or, you know, but, but not really. He, he uh, you know, he has these beautiful descriptions of Lima in some, in some ways, he, you know. Uh, so I don't, I, don't, I don't know if the story was, was you know, about, about juxtaposing a, a kind of a, a American dynamism in the form of Delano and a kind of decrepit, you know, Spanish, you know, lethargic Spanish Catholicism embodied in Sereno. I don't think that that was what Melville was doing, although some literary people, you know, back in the day, in the, you know, decades ago, was, was reading Benito Sereno in those ways. But I don't, you know, it goes back to the question of what do you use the literature for, and I'm not, I'm not that interested in making an argument about whether Melville was, a, was, a, was, a, was subverting the black legend or upholding it. Back in the back. Um, you mentioned that uh, Ahab's obsession uh, can be looked at as a device of ego uh, or also through the social aspects of uh, Jacksonian America. I'm just curious as to if you have an opinion as to which one is the more influential factor, if at all. Well, it's a work, again, this goes to the question of literature. It's a work, you could, I mean, you could read a work of literature and you can interpret it as, as, you, as you think it is. I mean, I think that. I think that the the, the you know um, again to what degree is Melville absorbing a social critique, and what I think I think you know um, I think there is this uh, there is this I'm sympathetic to the interpretation that sees Ahab as an embodiment of this kind of extreme individual isolation that 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 is so often associated with Jacksonian America or the rise of a certain kind of ideology of. Of individual supremacy, um, you know. There's some great quotes in Moby Dick, you know, about you know Mel, about Ahab, you know, railing against, you know, I can't remember the in, interdependence of humanity, you know, the ledger book that you know, and basically it means just like what one person owes another just for being alive, you know, just for being human, you know, and 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 the only thing that kind of tentatively draws him out. Is you know Pip the 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 black the black cabin boy, and so he is, you know so but he is this goes back to another question about intimacy and these odd connections. So just a little bit of a divergence from your question is so what does one do with this coincidence, right? So so um, so the slave road that Babo and Mori and the rest of them are marched over over the Andes. 
1804, 1805, late 1804, is exactly the same path that Charles Darwin, 30 years later, crosses out, coming from the other direction, looking out at the Pampas. And if you read the vo if you read the journal, you know the, the the Voyage of the Beagle book that com that comes out, you know not the not the or not the Origins of the Species, the one that comes out describing his voyages, and you know on the Beagle. The most exhilarating paragraph in that book is, Mel is, is Darwin's vision at that moment on that slave where he looks out and he sees and he realizes that the pampas are really the ocean. And he gives this unbelievable description of like the earth rising up and coming down and going down to the bottom. And, you know, it's an unbelievable description. Melville takes that. This is my interpretation of it. But Mel Melville takes, it's known that Melville read that book. Melville takes that passage and he basically rewrites it and he assigns that vision to Pip, the young black cabin boy on the, on, on the Pequod. And Pip is, 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 is on a whale boat. He almost goes off when a whale hits the bottom of the boat. He's grabbed by Stubb, you know, the, the guy, the, I, I can't remember, you know, first mate, whoever Stubb is, I can't remember, who says, be careful, Pip, if, you know, you know, this your, you know, that whale that we had to lose in order to save you is worth more than you would fetch in an Alabama slave market. And then sure enough, another, you know, Pip falls over overside and he's left and he's left to float away and the boat goes off to chase a, chase a whale. And Pip has this incredible vision where he goes down to the ocean. If you actually compare the two paragraphs, it's not exact, you know, it's not, it's not quite, um, you know, there's no sentences which are exactly alike, but if you compare the Darwin paragraph that I'm talking about where he has this vision on this look, standing on the slave world where Babo crosses over looking out at the pampas and he sees this enormous vision, and you compare the paragraph that Melville attributes to Pip's vision, you know, um, it's, it's unbelievably similar. It's about going down to the ocean and seeing God's foot on the treadle, on the, you know, treadle of the loom, and, you know, and, and he comes back a little, a little crazy, but not crazy. He comes back more fully human. He's the, you know, Ishmael also has a little bit of a vision of totality. But then Ishmael has this great, but Ishmael, who at, who at the beginning of Moby Dick says, who ain't a slave, tell me that, right? This is antebellum America. Who ain't a slave? It's clear who ain't a slave in antebellum America in, 18, in the 1850s. And it certainly isn't Ishmael, who's probably the freest man possible. He's white. He's single. He has no ties. He's able to do what he wants. He joins a ship because he's a little bored and alienated. He joins the cruise. You know, he had, you know, it's completely his own free will, and yet he has the he has the he has the arrogance and cosmic self centeredness to to say, "Who ain't a slave? Tell me that." And when he has his vision of totality, he has this whole thing about how time begins with man. So he doesn't really grasp the meaning of what he sees. It's Pip, right, who's just told that he's worth less than what the oil of a slave is worth, uh, a whale is worth that sees the vision, you know, sees the enormity of time, the emptiness of time, or the possible emptiness of time, the possible meaningless of time, what deep, what the geologists and Darwin and Charles Lyell told, called deep time, and understands what it means in terms of human, Melville was obsessed with this question. And so Melville assigns it to, you know, to the black cabin boy, and, and, he, and, and it's a vision that, Dar that he gets from Darwin, that Darwin has, on the road where Babo and Morio, you know, were, were, were forced marched up on the beginning of Ramadan. I mean, it's 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 kind of hard to quite know what to do with all of that, the intertextual, you know, uh, uh, associations. But there's some there's something there which I haven't haven't figured out. But but um, but there's a lot of there's the, you know it's 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 the density, right? It's the, it goes back to the way slavery was such an all-encompassing institution that it gives meaning to these random events.